This lesson is the first lesson for HRTM 1120, and it is Introduction to Cruising. It is going to come from the CLIA Guide to the Cruising Industry by Mark Mancini. And we're going to review chapter one, which is an introduction um, to the book and to the rest of the content. Unit objectives here, uh, we're just going to understand what the term cruise means for the purposes of our class. We'll also talk about uh, the history of the cruising industry and how it affects today's cruise vacation experience. We'll also describe uh, what it's like now, the contemporary cruise experience versus uh, in the past. And then we'll also talk about some different uh, types of itineraries and what those look like. So what is cruising for the purposes of our class? Cruising, the definition given by the book, is simply a vacation trip by ship. It's just that simple. It really includes um, traveling for leisure purposes. So it excludes things like purely business purposes, uh, cargo ships, uh, doing your own small sailing of a yacht or something like that. Uh, cruising is more uh, a vacation trip taken by ship, and we'll talk about what those ships uh, are beginning to look like in the 21st century. It's important to know that sailing for pleasure really was not the initial intention of cruise ships or um, ships that were meant to essentially bring cargo back and forth. Uh, they also were used to transport people from one destination to another. If you think about places like Ellis Island, for instance, you'll remember that several immigrants were brought from Europe to the Americas on, on a ship. And so the True purpose in that regard was to uh, really a, a modes of tra transportation for people to immigrate from one society to the next. So ships are were mainly used for the purposes of transporting goods, which is still used today. You'll see lots of ships transporting containers, which would include merchandise, cars, the things that you buy in grocery stores and in stores, uh, retail stores today, simply are goods that are going to be shipped via cargo ship. So you'll see a lot of those. And then your uh, 18 wheelers that are driving on the roads today, they are carrying those containers typically that are shipped from overseas with um, goods. And then of course we've talked about the people. In the 1800s, shipping companies really started to think about this in a way of increasing profit. And so what they did was began to book passengers aboard their merchant ships. So they're not only bringing those goods that we talked about, but they also said, well, hey, we can add people, they can pay us, and that can be a, an additional mode of income for us. And so eventually they started building these vessels uh, not just for cargo, but for people. And they started to call those steamships. Technology really helped to make this possible, where wooden ships uh, with sails were replaced by the steel hold vessels, and they're driven by coal, oil, and steam, and not by wind, which is um, how ships were essentially moving uh, in the past. And so we know that ocean liners began to appear in the 1900s, and that's a ship similar to this uh, picture here, also similar to the image that you might have of Titanic, that was considered an ocean liner. The major purpose of ocean liner in those times was to carry immigrants and not necessarily the well-to-do. And so that's where most of the money was made. The ships were also divided into classes, which would be first, uh, second and third, or third was also called the steerage class, and that was really for the masses. That's for the general population. So if you think about that in terms of what you know about travel today and airline travel, for instance, you could consider that to be the coach class of uh, an aircraft, but in this case, we're talking about ships. On any given sailing, there might be uh, 100 passengers in the first class, 
102nd and 2000 in, th in the third class or in the steerage uh, area. So again, that really kind of brings to mind an aircraft and how m the majority of people are going to be back in coach and you'll have a few up in first or business class. And so that's um, a way to look at it. The contrast between first and steerage was really striking. Um, the difference was in the surroundings, uh, the music, the amenities there, and those folks that were in steerage, the food that they ate, the uh, quarters that they lived in were very uh, likened to dormitories where they slept on cots or uh, bunk beds, if you will. And so, Steerage was really, hey, I need to get to, you know, another part of the world. And again, these are people maybe picking up their lives and moving to another area. And so they're not ones that are going to be spending a lot of money on the sailing of the ship. And so those few folks that are in first class are going to be the well-to-do. So after World War One. Most of those ocean crossing vessels were converted into troop transport ships. So these were used in the war. And then after the war, they were joined with new, a new generation of ships, bigger, sleeker, and above all, faster. Speed became the most important goal because, again, they're trying to get people from one place to the next. And so it was all about how fast you could do that. In the 1920s and 30s, the ships began to offer more entertainment on board so that it, it would attract more middle class passengers and provide some of that pampering that we start to see in today's cruising. One interesting note is that during Prohibition, which is the time in which alcohol was prohibited uh, from being sold or um, drunk in America, a board of cruise ship was really the only place you could drink liquor because it was on the seas and it wasn't necessarily included in that um, prohibition because it was not on land. Onboard casinos were still rare, so they weren't there yet, but we do know from current uh, modern cruise ships that uh, one without a casino is almost unheard of now nowadays. So at this time, cruise ships became larger. Governments decided that, hey, this is a new industry that we should subsidize. So they started putting money towards that. And so nations could have ocean liners as a symbol of the prosperity and the taste uh, and the might of their uh, society. So contemporary cruising as we know it today was birthed really around the 1950s, 1960s. And one key element to that was that airlines began offering commercial service across the Atlantic. Well, what does that mean? That means that I can get to from point A to point B much, much faster, really within the matter of hours, as opposed to a matter of days, weeks, and sometimes even months to get from one point to another. And so the ability to be able to do that really shut down the means of cruising for transportation. Using it to get from one place to the next really all but died in the 1950s, 1960s. And so cruise industry, as most industries do that have a big disruption, will find a new way, a new business model of performing business. And so what they did was decided, hey, we can turn these into uh, an amenity that people can actually come on, and this is the destination, so to speak. There's lots of entertainment options, the food, the rooms, things like that that can begin to offer new amenities and rethink their business model. So they didn't do it to cross the ocean necessarily, but cruising for the fun of it was born. So today, those smaller cruising ships uh, that were cruising the Caribbean really became the business model for today's style of cruising. Just kind of floating 
in the ocean. Now we're starting to, you know, go to different ports. But the fact that it was a fun experience in and of itself was something that was really the new business model. So mega ships, what we see today are the new status quo for the industry. Um, endless entertainment options, food, drink. Of course, they're stopping at wonderful ports of call. And they're really doing it for leisure purposes. That was the conversion that was made to all of those cruise vessels was that, hey, we're going to take out those bulkheads that, you know, we're separating classes and things like that. And we're going to do things like in putting in air conditioning, pool areas. Of course, the casino started to come in. And again, they started to um, really reef or retrofit those uh, ships so that it could especially be used for the purposes of cruising for fun. Some interesting information about the types of cruising that you can do today or what your itinerary might look like. You might have, and most people will have, a round trip or a circle itinerary. This is also called closed jaw. And essentially what this means is that your cruise ship is leaving from one port and returning back to that same port. And so most of your itineraries will look like this today. Say you're leaving from the uh, Port of Miami, going to, hey, Bahamas, even Jamaica, and then coming back to Miami. That's a circle itinerary. And again, most of your itineraries will look like this. Another option, though, is a one-way itinerary or what we call an open jaw. And so what happens here is that you start at one location and then you would end at a different location. Your book gives an example of uh, passengers starting in Anchorage, for instance, and ending in Vancouver or vice versa. You can do that and you would essentially have to, as the cruise passenger, make sure that you arrange your flight options so that you uh, depart from one place and then arrive in another place. So uh, you would probably do two one-way tickets to to and from your home destination. But that's also an option. It's not as bad as an option. Uh, and when you're on that cruise, your passengers are going to experience really a wealth of onboard activities, no matter if it's a round trip or a one way. You will have sea days or days at sea, which essentially is when that ship is traveling a long distance without stopping at any ports. And this typically happens that first night of your cruise is going to be getting to that first destination. So that would be a sea day. But then you'll also have other days, depending on how long your itinerary is and where your ports of call are, that are essentially only going to be out at sea. Uh, and those are days that you can explore the ship and do some other things on board. And we'll talk about that later on in the semester. But then you're also going to have what's called port days or days at port. And this is usually when the ship will dock early in the morning at your port of call and then leave in the evening, sometimes even the next day, depending on what your itinerary will look like. And passengers will have the option to go offshore or go onshore, I'm sorry, and do things uh, like shopping, do some excursions, or you could stay on the ship. And some folks will find that that's the quietest time to be on the ship and the time where you can, you know, access the most amenities without a lot of people and standing in line and things like that. Your book has some sample itineraries on pages eight and nine so that you can look at and see what a round trip itinerary would look like versus a one way itinerary. And then um, there's a video here of Harmony of the Seas. Um, this is currently the largest ship in the world, and it is a Royal Caribbean ship. And I'm waiting for it to load up for you. Oh, it's saying that it won't, so let me give it just a second. Really interesting six minute video, just watching how such a massive, really a city floating on water is built uh, within a, 
the span of months, but this video will show you really the span of five minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so that was just a good quick little video to see how much goes into pulling together these mega ships that we know of today. This concludes the lecture notes for lesson one. For your lesson one quiz, your password is Harmony, H-A-R-M-O-N-Y. Thanks for watching.